and I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up, rise up, rise up. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Midnight Ride. My name is David Carrico, and it is my great honor once again to welcome each and every one of you into the Puritan Barn for the Midnight Ride with myself and John Pounders. Tonight, the broadcast is entitled Time Travel, Trump, and the Tesla Connection, the Conspiracy Corner. I tell you what, that title is just enough uh, to do me right there. And before we begin this broadcast, I'm sure that you're all aware of the Neil Young, Joe Rogan, Spotify controversy. So I thought I might weigh in with the official Midnight Ride position on that controversy. And in the words of Leonard Skinner, we don't need O'Neill around anyhow. So wave bye-bye to Neil because we are now live, live, live. What's up, guys? And tonight... I am the conspiracy cowboy, and that's right. This is a cowboy hat with aluminum foil, and we're going to be discussing a conspiracy that intrigued me and will intrigue a lot of you, and we're going to bring this full circle and just check it out. This is, uh, this is crazy, the crazy stuff, so uh, be ready for that. And let us know where you guys are from in the chat. We love to hear that. That's so cool when, when I see that all over the world, man, all over the world. And so, David, anyways, how are you doing? I'm going to take this hat off now. Doing this fantastic. Is... Um, the Lord is just doing marvelous things, and there are just some really awesome things working out real, real well. So we're just really thankful for all the Lord's done. Yeah, me too, man. It's just been it's been so cold. We had a huge ice storm here. I know, I know you, you know, here at the barn, you guys lost power for a couple hours, and some people lost it for a lot longer, but thankfully— it's all passed and over with. And, you know, I remember back when there was a freeze a few years ago where people were out of power for like two weeks, you know, yeah. uh, freezing cold temperatures had to move out of their house, all their pipes busted. So we're thankful that didn't happen here, but let us know how you guys are doing. Uh, before we get started tonight, I want to thank our sponsors, Joshua Watts leather company, um, custom leather jobs from anything from saddles all the way to gun holsters to book covers, you name it, the guy can do it. And he has a lot of other stuff on his website as well. He's been supplying us with goods for a long time and also a lot of you guys. And so he's one of our uh, premier sponsors that we have here. Also check out nystv.org and you can check out some commentaries, different shows that we have, documentaries and stuff on that website. And if you use the coupon code RIDE, R-I-D-E, you can get your first month free and check it out. See if you like it. If you don't like it, feel free to cancel. We just want to make sure it's available for people to check out and uh, have a place for that to happen. Also, Sugar and Spice Soap Company, uh, stop worrying about rubbing toxic chemicals on your skin. Check out Sugar and Spice Soap Company. They even have a Midnight Ride brand soap and pack that is pretty awesome. So all the links are in the descriptions. Um, and that's I think that covers anything, David, you got to say? Well, I tell you what I would recommend. Take a shower, use your Midnight Ride soap, then watch the midnight ride. How could yeah. it get any better than that? <laughs> it can't get any better than that. I don't it couldn't know. Couldn't get it, any better. So, anyways, David. With that being said, um, I guess I'm ready. If you're Let's ready, let's ride. All right, guys. So tonight we're going to be talking about a conspiracy, and it says it all in the title. It's about time travel, Trump, and Tesla, and there's a connection with all of these things. And a lot of people have done videos on this stuff in the past. And there's a lot of uh, tidbits here and different channels, and some of those channels I've actually featured in tonight's show. But um, this, in my opinion, this would be the first one that kind of brings all of those things kind of full circle into one episode. And to me, it was very intriguing. Uh, there's 
the chances of these things being coincidence by the time I got done to me were it, it was my it was mind blowing. I just don't think that there's a chance that some of these things are coincidences. And we've talked about uh, different things on different shows. And this one uh, has intrigued me probably the most out of all the conspiracy theories. If that's not mind blowing in itself, that's pretty because we've looked at a lot of conspiracy theories, but this one definitely intrigues the mind. So the first thing we're going to be discussing is uh, a couple books written by an Ingersoll Lockwood. And one of them is entitled The Last President. And uh, the other is entitled Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey. And uh, both of these books have very interesting things in them that we're going to dig into. And there's also a lot of other coincidences that kind of go along with this stuff that we're going to talk about uh, tonight as well. And hopefully you guys can enjoy it as much as I enjoyed researching it and much as, uh, you know, we've, we're going to enjoy talking about it. So it, let me just kind of set the stage for uh, this first book we're going to discuss, and it's The Marvelous Underground Journey with Baron Trump. Okay, so... First off, I want to say that the person that wrote this book, by the time I got finished with it, I realized that this person uh, is 100% adept in the mysteries. Like, there's no doubt about it. I, I looked at all of the different wording they use and all of that, and it really just kind of brought a lot of intrigue to my mind. And I'm going to read kind of just one, a couple of different excerpts, but this um, basically the gist of it is Baron Trump grows up in this uh, Trump Tower, this Trump Castle. He's getting tired of living the luxurious life. He has a little dog, and they decide uh, to go on a journey to the center of the earth. And there's this uh, guy that leads them. His name is Don, okay? And as they lead them, they go through different portals. They go through uh, meeting different kinds of beings in the earth and time travel and all of these different things. And we're just going to go through some of these things. And hopefully I'll bring some things out, too, that I don't think anybody else has brought out as well. Uh, this character known as Don being one of them. So in this in this uh, book, and I've highlighted here in the book, and you can check this book out for free on the Library of Congress online, and you can also buy it for a few dollars. So it's pretty interesting. And so I'm going to start here at the top. It says, It so happened at the time of Bolger's Low Spirits, which is his dog, uh, that the elder baron had, through the kindness of an old school friend, come into possession of a 15th century manuscript from the pen of no less celebrated thinker and philosopher than the learned Spaniard Don Constantino Bartholomew Stephrel Lofage. I believe that's how you pronounce it, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce that last word. Maybe I will. Guaner, Guanarius Fum, commonly known among scholars as Don Fum, entitled A World Within a World. In this work, Don Fum advances the wonderful theory that there is every reason to believe that the interior of our world is inhabited. So, this guy, Don Fum, so I looked up Don Fum, I tried to figure it out because it says that commonly known among scholars as Don Fum, and I know that the way that the mystery religions work is they hide their mysteries in etymology, they hide it in symbols, and they hide it in names, and so I looked into the etymology of these words. So the first word is Don, and uh, Don actually means Lord, Master, Owner, okay? And so that's the first word, Don. The next word here is... Um, Fum, and this actually means to play upon a fiddle. So what we have here is the Lord of the fiddle, right? We have the Lord of the fiddle. And I, I know that a lot of people can think of a popular song. The devil went down to Georgia. He had the fiddle. He was, he was the fiddle player, right? He had the fiddle of gold. And this actually goes back even further to the Baroque period uh, in the 1600s. And they have this devil's trill sonata. You can read this. I'll leave this up here for a second, screenshot it, whatever. But uh, this is a this is an old concept of the devil being this fiddle player, and I think it goes back to some of the scriptures in the Bible that talks about you know he was embedded with the strings and the pipes and and talking about the archangel and all of these different things. So this is our Don Fum. He is the Lord of the violin or the fiddle, and uh, or master of the violin and the fiddle. So if that adds anything to this whole thing, so also we got in the book here. Um, it, it talks about him being in a place called Castle Trump. And it says here, it says, Yes, I understand thee, now faithful companion, and I promise thee that before this moon hath filled her horns, we shall once more turn our backs on Castle Trump, up and away in the search of portals to Don Fum's world within a world. And so um, another thing that I found interesting in here, and this is 
the family was originally a French Huguenot, it says, okay. And in the end, by the end of the time, uh, end of the book, they actually come together in Germany and celebrate, which is where German roots are. But this is the Huguenot. So I, I looked at the Huguenot connection in the Trump family, um, and I couldn't, I, I couldn't actually find like a Huguenot connection. But what I did find here is that actually Trump Plaza, which is uh, a place that is um, right on in New Rochelle, is actually on Huguenot Street, which I thought was pretty interesting hmm. as well. And a lot of the the genealogies that they list in the beginning of this book are actually um, um, things that you can kind of look up. You can look up like where this family comes from, and obviously we know the um, the things that it tells us in the book. And some of the names, you could probably dig deeper into the names and look at the etymology. I didn't do it with every single name. Like I could have spent probably 30 minutes on each page of this book kind of looking at the different symbolism in the things that it speaks. Uh, but what happens after this, they go to this place uh, in, they call it the Giant's Well. And this place is in the Northern Urals. And this is also uh, Quarry of the Demons, as it's called. And it says, uh, this is from the book here. It says, I'd often read of what travelers termed the quarries of the demons in the northern Urals, but never till now had I the faintest notion of what the expression meant. And so here we have a map of the Ural Mountains. You can kind of see where this is right here. Uh, what I found interesting about the Ural Mountains when I was researching it is it is commonly um referred to or it's referred to by Heracles um that the Hyperboreans were connected to the Scythian Scythians and how the Riffian Mountains were in fact the Ural Mountains so there's this connection that leads the Ural Mountains to uh Hyperborea and if you've we've done um a, quite a few shows on Hyperborea and and David that we did some Book of Enoch's that were really interesting as well that talked about Enoch's trip to this place and this this is it, it's it gets crazier just hold bear with me here for a second i'm gonna throw a couple more connections out here then i want uh to me and david are going to discuss a little bit and we'll kind of keep going but i promise you it only gets better from here this stuff is just mind-blowing to me so right here in this part of the book we have him going to uh this it's this funnel the there were the it's called the polyphemus funnel and it's near it reached and where he reached the bottom of the giant's well now in this giant's well Polyphemus, if, if for those of you that don't know what that is, Polyphemus is actually a cyclops uh, mentioned in Homer's Odyssey. And um, so cyclops is another use for a cyclone in this, okay? So a cyclops, cyclone, uh, they use that word for um, whirlwinds, okay? And, and as you guys know, we've talked about whirlwinds. David has actually kind of went into whirlwinds kind of bit. So I want to play this uh, real quick so he, David can... He doesn't have all his notes in front of him like he did last time, so we're going to play this for you guys so that you can see it. And also, our President Bush, the, when he was uh, in office, talking about when he was inaugurated, talking about the angel and the whirlwind. So hold, here we go. After the Declaration of Independence was signed, Virginia statesman John Page wrote to Thomas Jefferson, "We know the race is not to the swift." nor the battle to the strong. Do you not think an angel rides in the whirlwind and directs this storm? Much time has passed since Jefferson arrived for his inauguration. The years and changes accumulate, but the themes of this day, he would know. Our nation's grand story of courage and its simple dream of dignity. We are not this story's author who fills time and eternity with his purpose. Yet his purpose is achieved in our duty, and our duty is fulfilled in service to one another. Never tiring, never yielding, never finishing, we renew that purpose today to make our country more just and generous, to affirm the dignity of our lives and every life. This work continues, the story goes on, and an angel still rides in the whirlwind and directs this storm. In the book of Job, chapter 38 and verse 1, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. In the book of Enoch, chapter 39, verse 3, 
And in those days, a whirlwind carried me off from the earth and set me down at the end of the heavens. Enoch was taken up in a whirlwind and when the gate opens there's a wind come through and when the gate opened for the father to speak to Job there was a whirlwind there and we know with uh, Elijah and it came to pass as they still went on and talked that behold there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven and in Ezekiel 1 and 4, when, when what we had there was what scholars would call a theophany, uh, a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ in Ezekiel 1 and 4, and I looked and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof, as the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire. and. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the the vision that followed. So here, here we have there this whirlwind. He's reaching this whirlwind that he calls this eye of Cyclops, or, and he's getting ready to descend into the earth. And so I thought, you know, when I heard the word whirlwind, obviously I know that in the scripture that that is a the term for the portal. And David, you heard in your own words, you describing these portals. What do you make of some of this so far, David? Well, the thing that, and you know, for someone that doesn't believe in coincidence, this has just got my little mind going pity pat. And just think of the coincidence of mentioning the Trump castle, the Trump Tower. And is it a coincidence that Mr. Trump's address in New York City is 666? (laughs) Just a coincidence. Now, and the, the Ural Mountain connection, now already... We have a spiritual connection on the wrong side of things with Gog and Magog right there with Tartaria, Mm -hmm. the Gomerian giants, all right there in that area in the Ural Mountains, the very beginning of the Caucasian peoples and the obsession with the underworld. And Adolf Hitler was obsessed with the underworld. It was his goal to make contact with the people of the underworld to get them to breed with the German people to create the super race. And I believe that the final dictator, the beast of Revelation 13, he will be as obsessed with the underworld as Hitler was. Mm. So we see so many things already. They're just connecting and the, the, it's going ding, ding, ding already. But wait, there's more. And we're going to talk a little bit about this portal and something that that uh, another YouTuber found really interesting. And I enjoy yeah. some of this guy's videos because he found, he, he looked at some, he like when I watched his videos, like, man, this guy saw some of the things, things, things I saw. Yeah. And just briefly on that angel, of the whirl, whirlwind, that's right out of third Enoch. That's one of the foundational uh, Kabbalistic writings of the Zohar. Anybody that is schooled in uh that Kabbalistic mysticism, that's a message to them right there. They know what Bush is talking about there. Coming through the gates. For sure. And um, this is going to be interesting, too, because this kind of throws a whole other theory of uh, time travel into the mix here. And I'm going to play this. This is a video clip from Enter the Stars on YouTube. And he did. Uh, he's done a series of different videos on this subject. And so I want to play this, and I want to give him the credit that he deserves on that. So... I want to check this. You guys check this out. We'll be right back. I despair upon finding the pipe of the funnel too small for my body. Now here's where things get interesting because Baron can't fit through the portal. But watch what he does next. A ray of hope breaks in upon me. Full account of how I, how I succeeded in entering the pipe of the funnel. My passage through it. Bulger's timely aid. The marble highway and some curious things concerning the entrance to the world within a world. So, the rocky sides of the Polyphenous funnel were apparently as well polished as those of any tin funnel that I had ever been uh, ever seen hanging in the kitchen of Castle Trump. So making fast my, ta- my tackle and taking Bulger in my arms, away we were sliding down, the side with the line passed under my arm for safety's sake. 
It was nearly 100 feet to the bottom before I had measured off the full length of my line before I had come to the apex of this gigantic cone. So, down through the portal. And this is where we begin to see clues of things that might relate directly to what is happening right now. Now understand that the electric universe was in its infancy in the year 1890 in the real world. And so we have Baron entering this coil pipe. I guess it's a tin pipe, maybe. And of course, coiling is one of the main components of the electric generator. But he gets stuck and he can't go any further. Now that could be a reference to a magnetic polarity that magnetically he could not pass through. So what does he do? He wraps himself up and he smears black lead all over his body so he can quote unquote fit through the funnel. Now as we read this, understand that lead is diamagnetic. In other words, it repels magnets powerful magnets which is exactly what you would need to slip through a magnetic portal right a coiled wire think of the copper being coiled the way it was let's read this it was tight as i could bear and change and change the slip knot into a hard one then having made the other end of the line fast to the side of the funnel i proceeded to wind myself up as housewives often do a big sausage to keep it from bursting. This done I set about rolling in the black lead. Until I was thoroughly smeared of it. There was now but one thing more to do. Before dropping myself into the pipe. And that was to make fast the weight to my feet. It was no easy task. Wound up as I was. With my arms lashed down against my body. But by the, by the use of the slip knots. I finally accomplished the feat. And sitting down. Put my legs into the pipe. And drew a long breath. For I felt as if I was skewered up in a straight jacket. Bending down, I called out for Bulger. So he sent Bulger down first. Bulger went through okay because he was a small dog. And then here he comes with this technique that he uses to slide down through this pipe. So he's successful by wiping this lead all over him. So what is this about? Well, lead is diamagnetic. And basically it repels magnets. Here's actually a video on I think. I think I have a video here on it. Here it is here. Let's play just a part of this. Hi there. That's the brass and the lead. This guy takes this uh, copper. So geode. No, I'm sorry, not geode. Um, a neodymium magnet, which is a very powerful magnet. So that's the aluminium. Then the brass, then the lead. And then the copper <laughs> and the G-clamp. You'll see it goes slowly over the aluminium, then quicker over the brass, a lot quicker over the lead, and then it slows down again over the copper. And that's because of the different electrical resistivities, the electrical resistance. Uh, the copper has got the, uh, the lowest resistance, uh, then the aluminium, then the brass, and then the lead. And the lower the electrical resistance, the higher the current, the higher the current, the stronger the uh, magnetic field that's produced. So, was Baron smearing this lead all over his body? Was this magnetic in principle? You have to ask yourself. I believe it was. I believe that they were describing a magnetic type of electrical um, interface that allowed him to get through this portal. And this is the whole basis of this whole Trump the Time Traveler aspect. Biff. Biff Tannen. Back to the Future there's some kind of technology where they're opening portals. So that kind of sums that up, David. Any thoughts as you listen to that? Just a few thousand. Okay. And what comes to my mind 
very explicitly. Well, no, well, number one, in this book, there's a portal in the Trump castle. Well, having an address 666 with all kinds of statues of gods, are they thinking about a portal? Just saying, just saying. But in the Bible, there's also a use of lead going through portals. In Zechariah chapter 5 and verse 6, there's the vision Whoa. of the woman in the basket. And it says in Zechariah 5 and 6, And I said, What is it? And he said, This is an ephah that goeth forth. He said, Moreover, this is their resemblance to all the earth. And behold, there was lifted up a talent of lead. Whoa. And this is the woman that sitteth Whoa. in the midst of the ephah. And the Whoa. last verse this woman is using the lead. Well, she's coming from a bad place through a portal. Where is she going? Verse 11, And he said unto me to build it an house in the land of Shinar, and it shall be established and set there upon her own base. Oh, my gosh. Wow. I did not even know that. Man, wow. Wow. Yeah, wow. Wow. So, gosh, yeah, wow. Um, it, it, yeah, wow. Is this lead technology? of bringing things through portals. Is this what the bad guys are going to use to set up the final shebang? Mm. Man, it's interesting. And you know, too, I mean, that's mind blowing to me right there. Wow. That's worth the price of admission already. Oh, I but, tell you what. <laughs> but think about the way that they've outlawed lead and paint anymore, you know, keeping magnetism oh. from entering into your home and all of these different things. I mean, there's, there's something there. Yeah, they don't even want lead and pencils anymore. No. They, no lead paint. No, lead is just evil, evil, evil. Well, maybe that's hindering them, or I don't know. I mean, but it's just a, a, I don't believe in coincidence. I think that is 100% solid that they're using lead in their technology of going through portals and dimensions. Yeah, and the fact that they're using graphene inside injections as well. Oh, you know, what yeah. is there to that? That's crazy. Oh, yeah, gosh. But it gets weirder, so we're going to keep going a little bit weirder here, a little bit deeper, weirder, unless you got something else no, to add to that. No, I'm... Okay, so as he goes through the portal, the first thing he finds, he's in this black tunnel, and he run, He run. all of a sudden he sees these tongues of fire, okay? And these, sees the what? He sees tongues of fire tongues that are lighting tongues. Tongues, tongues. tongues of right. fire that are lighting up a cave and these are the things that are emitting these tongues of fire this reptilian race and he says there's like 10,000 of them as they he starts seeing their eyes glow etc that he usually goes down into this this portal and at the bottom of the portal and it even gets weirder from here so next he this it talks about these mica men and I'm going to read this passage here a couple of these here just because I want to set the stage for what we're talking about here it says yes sir stranger he said in a low musical voice Thou art indeed of the land of the Mink Mika Minkies, the Mica men, in the land of the transparent folk, called also Goggle Land. But if I should show thee my heart, thou wouldst see that I am deeply pained to think that I should have been the first to bid thee welcome. For know, sir stranger, that thou speaketh with Master Cold Soul, the court depressor, the saddest man in all of Google Goggle Land. And by the way, sir, permit me to offer thee a pair of goggles for thyself and also a pair for thy four-footed companion. Uh, and now, dear friends, I must explain. And, and okay, so first off, they, they're in this place called Goggle Land. You talked about Gog Magog. It also reminds me of Google a little bit. And for some reason, they got to put these goggles on when they enter into this place. And um, I did a little bit of digging on these Micah men. And Micah, Micah is actually... Uh, in, and I'll explain that here in a second, but I want to read this here first. It says, And now, dear friends, I must explain that by the laws of the Mikaminkis, each man, woman, and child must wear in their garment a heart-shaped opening on their breast directly over their hearts with a corresponding one at the back. So under certain conditions, when the law allows it, each may have the right to look at his neighbor's hearts and see exactly. And it goes on to say, see what their heart is, see like how their heart is, what they're talking, you know, what they're doing and all that. And, etc. So I went in and did a little bit more research on mica and mica stones are actually in, in, in heart chakra. Mica stones have to do with the heart and the circulatory system of the heart. And so you have these shimmering, transparent people with a hole in their garment cut around their heart, which I thought was pretty interesting because you talk, it, it also describes in this book as this being this kind of electric place down underneath the ground to where uh, electricity is down there and that's kind of how they reside in this electricity 
they they're always talking about down about the earth you know like you guys have to live on the earth and worry about the sun and worry about the cold and all of that it's it's horrible for you guys down there kind of you know express expressing to baron and his dog that they shouldn't have to deal with such things and there's this queen galaxa that's in charge of all of this area and it's this beautiful place underground and what I, the instantly what I thought of, David, when I heard about this kind of electric thing with these transparent beings, I thought of the verse in uh, Luke ten eighteen where it says, and it says, and he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning falling from heaven. Now, my question is, if they reside in electricity, if this is something I, I want you to expand on this, hopefully you can give me a little bit more insight into this, but uh, if they are able to react within electricity, then what are we doing up here that maybe is trying to allow them to once again come up to the surface to be able to rule up here on the earth? You know, this is that, that was my thoughts. What do you what do you think, David? I'm interested to hear. Well, in the book of Enoch, chapter 44, it states that the judgment upon some of the fallen powers was that they were to remain in the form of lightning. This is the actual form of some of the fallen powers, according to the book of Enoch. And in this um, scenario, this is laced with symbolism that people uh, on the wrong side of things, and even the good side of things, if you're, if you're learned, can understand and the tongues of fire, of course, Enoch, the book of Enoch also, he saw the tongues of fire in the third heaven. And we know the tongues of fire on the day of Pentecost. And here we have a counterfeit tongues. Everything in the dark kingdom is an imitation of that. And it connects disturbingly well with the scenario in Zechariah 6, building a house for this woman. Yes. It, it, it shows the establishment of a false religion and also the heart. It's very reminiscent of the sacred heart of Jesus, the Eucharistic heart of Jesus. We've probably all seen these pictures of Jesus mm -hmm. with, the, the, with the big heart there on the outside. And not the real Jesus, but the Eucharistic Jesus. So just tons of symbolism. This guy is absolutely uh, an adept that knows how to use symbols to communicate. And that's what these guys like to do. They want to communicate in symbols, so the average person that would read it would just think, well, this is crazy. But someone that is adept, they understand just what they're talking about. Yeah, for sure. I know. I know you talked about too, like in one, in the episode that I showed earlier, where you were talking about the angel and the whirlwind. You also talked about in Acts two, which you just mentioned, the tongues of fire. But there was a sound of wind, yeah. so the whirlwind is connected with yeah. the tongues of fire there as well. Yeah. Uh, except the whirlwind that we're talking about actually ascends up. This one ascends down into the depths of the earth, which is, yeah. uh, you know, as above, so below type thing. Yeah, and I believe totally in the biblical cosmology. I be, believe we have three heavens, and I believe there is an underworld that is so much going on there. We've talked a lot about that in the recent Midnight Rides. And there are portals that connect our earth and our first heaven with the second, third heavens underworld. And this is how we understand all of the spiritual world. I am very, I'm just totally convinced of it. And when we start... Uh, thinking about uh, all of these other things, quantum physics, and I think there might be something to quantum physics on the dark side of things, but understanding that we have three heavens and earth and underworld connected by portals, I think this is exactly the way we understand what's going on in the good realm and the dark in the spiritual side of things. Yeah, it's interesting. In this book, uh, before we move on to like the connection with Tesla and Trump and all of that stuff, in this book, it, it also mentions that he's the first of his kind to actually enter into there and that there'll be visitors from here on out. You know what I mean? Like, so that there's going to be yearly visiting going on to this place. And, and of course, we know kind of what happened, what's been happening. It's, you, you talked about the, the Nazi connection with them, you know, doing everything they can to yeah. make it to the depth in the depths of the earth. Yeah. And so... And this was written, I guess, about 1900. Yeah, late, late 1800s. Or, or yeah, excuse me, late 1800s. Just a few years after that, Crowley brought Iwas yeah. through the, through the, the, the door. That's through right. The portal. Yeah. Just a few years after this. Yeah. And, you know, this is, this kind of gets into what we're getting ready to just talk about this portal 
And we're going to bring up the man Tesla because he does tie into this in a very real way in these in, in all of this. So he, um, this is a quote. He says, and this is the knowledge. We're going to discuss the knowledge he was talking about. He says, lock up this cosmic knowledge in a safe for a thousand years until man is ready for it. <laughs> and this is this is what we're talking about here. So this is something that, that Tesla said, and we've talked about this a little bit in other shows uh, because Tesla was all about tapping into – um, what the Germans would have called the vril, uh, what some called the aether, some call the, uh, the prana, depending on what um, religion you are. But this is from the Sanskrit, which is where one of the most original terms for this other than um, there I, that I know of. This is like the oldest mention of this electric universe comes from the Vedic text, which is written in Sanskrit, which is an Aryan text. So let me just read read what Nikola Tesla has to say about that. He says, all perceptible matter comes from a primary substance or tenuity beyond conception, filling all space, the akasha and or akasha or luma luminiferous ether, which is attacked attack act I'm sorry, I can't read it now, which is attacked upon by the living giving prana or creative force, calling into existence and in never ending cycles all things and phenomenon. And, you know, if you read a lot of more of his writings, he claims that basically everything that he received invention wise actually came from this uh, luminiferous ether or this prana uh, that he talks about. And uh, I have a video here I want to play, too, that kind of just shows the connection to Tesla and the Trump family uh, in a real way. And then we'll kind of discuss from here because this is really interesting. So here we go, guys. When Nikola Tesla died suddenly in 1943 in a hotel room in New York, there was a lot of intrigue, since he was so brilliant and worked on so many important things like motors and x-rays. A lot of people were worried that his unreleased work would fall into the wrong hands. So the FBI got involved and they just released 65 pages worth of documents surrounding that intrigue in response to a FOIA request from Muckrock. Apparently, Tesla's good friend, Blois Fitzgerald, told the FBI that Tesla told him that he had actually finished a revolutionary type of torpedo, which he hadn't told anyone about yet. And Fitzgerald said that Tesla also told him he completed a working model of a death ray and had hidden it in a lockbox in New York. Adding to the intrigue, Tesla had a relative he didn't like very much named Sava Kosanovich. Kasanovich was from Yugoslavia and had connections to the Axis powers, according to a New York Times source in the documents. And apparently Kasanovich was at the hotel on the night of Tesla's death and searched the lockbox. He ended up taking a few pictures only, apparently nothing major, but still, the intrigue swirled. So just to make sure they didn't miss out on Tesla's death ray, the FBI decided to have an expert thoroughly look over all the stuff Tesla had left behind. That expert was an MIT engineer who had worked for the government on stuff like radar research, so they trusted him. And that MIT engineer was none other than Donald Trump's uncle, John G. Trump. So Donald Trump's actual uncle was the person to inspect Tesla's supposed death ray machine. For real, you can't make that up. Now to me, that's pretty funny. I mean, maybe that's why Trump's so confident when it comes to bragging about our military and bossing other countries around. Maybe his brilliant scientist uncle saw some secret plans of Tesla's that the president nephew now knows about. From New York, I boarded a plane to Boston to find Dr. John Trump of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Dr. Trump was now retired from the company he founded, High Voltage Engineering, but he agreed to meet me at the company office the next morning. In the spring of 1943, Dr. Carl T. Compton, who was then president of MIT, asked me to go to New York and examine the effects of Nikola Tesla. These uh, were contained in, a, uh, in an upper floor of a warehouse somewhere in New York City. And uh, I spent a good deal of time examining one by one the papers, the books, and various other memorials that he had, had accumulated. But I was particularly looking for something which would uh, just be evidence of a secret weapon, which I was reminded by the agents, the two agents who were present during the entire time, uh, was uh, a matter of concern to the United States. In the course of this, I did come across a number of letters directed at the upper echelon of the British 
empire, that is, I think, to the king and queen, or perhaps just to the, uh, the king of England, and also to the Tsar of Russia, explaining that he was the inventor of a secret weapon which had rather remarkable uh, properties, and that uh, he would be interested in entering into a negotiation which would lead to a disclosure of how, what they were. Of course, I spent a good deal of time looking through these papers, trying to find out what the nature of this secret weapon was. I think I had, although I don't remember it so very accurately, an idea of what its properties were. It had the capability of acting at a great distance, of being destructive to flying objects and things of that kind at a place which was remote from the source. But nowhere in his technical papers did I find anything which revealed a, an explanation of just how such a device could operate. I believe that you um, also opened another box, uh, supposedly a secret weapon uh, that he left at another hotel. Can you relate that story, please? Yes, when I had uh, substantially concluded my study on the following day, I think that was a Saturday morning, I was reminded by the, one of the two agents that there was a, uh, a box uh, being held as a uh, security for an unpaid obligation and uh, that this bell box was uh, an item of considerable value and may indeed itself be the secret weapon, uh, that it was armed and therefore it probably was not touched. Were you nervous doing this? I found it, uh, I found it a matter of a bit of concern. <laughs> I, however, I re realized that this had to be done, and so we taxied down to this hotel. Uh, the agents identified themselves and their credentials to uh, the assistant manager of the hotel who led us to a room. This room was essentially at, uh, empty except for a table and a steel cabinet against the wall, which was opened. I think perhaps he opened it with a key. The cabinet itself was, was empty, except uh, on one of the lower shelves was a package, a box, a rectangular box of ordinary size, which was wrapped in brown wrapping paper. It uh, turned out to be a highly polished box with brass clasps, and uh, it looked more like an instrument case. And after waiting a while and listening a while and remembering that it had been there for quite a few years, I think it had actually been there for about five years as a security, I opened it. My report to Dr. Compton was that I saw no danger in releasing these papers and these relics to his heirs. Miss Musar had arrived too late to know who had opened Dr. Tezza's safe or what had been removed. And Dr. Trump had found nothing which he considered dangerous or a secret weapon. I guess I'd been a naturalized American citizen for 54 years. So why were his papers seized by agents of the custodian of alien property? I suspect that governments other than those of the United States, England, and Russia were interested in the inventions of Dr. Tesla. So there, this is there's a connection there, obviously, with Donald Trump and his uncle. There's more to this connection that we'll expose as we go later on, but... Uh, after watching this, David, off the bat, does anything come come to mind for you? Well, the obsession of the scientist and the obsession of the cultist converge over their obsession to go through portals. This is the belief of the people that constructed CERN, that they can actually contact people of other dimensions. And the, mes the, the fluid that... Mr. Tesla believed in. There is a reality to that. In the in the show Clot Shot Fever, we talked Ingersoll about Lockwood. how Mesmer talked about this fluid. He believed that this was the fluid, the same thing that uh, Tesla was talking about, or that would Hitler talked about the very same thing, the Vril. And Hitler believed the people of the Middle Earth had mastered the use of the Vril. And in the occult, the the people that worship the Baphomet 
in occult rituals. Eliphas Levi believed that this vril was the Holy Spirit. So this is the very place where science and science falsely so-called and the world of the occult, they all merge with their obsession of going through portals. For sure. And so this this next book that we're going to discuss about by Ingersoll Lockwood is... Um, we're going to, it's called The Last President, 1900 or The Last President. And this book right here was super interesting. A lot of really interesting connections that uh, we're going to talk about. But um, one being that there was a last president who would be an outsider, uh, who uh, riots would take place. And you'll see in this video that I play here in a minute where the riots take place and the coincidences associated with that. Um, and then you will see uh, also that the running mate of this president is last name Pence, uh, which is really interesting as well. And it talks about, um, you know, riots that take place over unfair election, et cetera. And so it gets better, man. Trust me. It's just really crazy, but we're going to watch this. This is, this is so crazy. Check this out. Ingersoll Lockwood, I believe is how you say it. Ingersoll Lockwood. <laughs> the three books focus on a character named Baron Trump. Note. That's his, that's. Yeah, that's Donald huh? Trump's son's <laughs> name. The three books that Mr. Lockwood wrote were one, Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey, written in 1893. Uh, 1900, or The Last President, written in 1896. And The Travels and Adventures of Little Baron Trump and His Wonderful Dog, Bulger written in 1890 the last president the book the last president begins with a scene from a panicked new york city on november 3rd the book describes it as quote a state of uproar after an Mm. end quote after an election of an enormously opposed (laughs) outsider candidate the reason that they were protesting the reason that New York City was a state of uproar was because they were protesting, quote, a corrupt and unethical election process. Here's a paragraph. <clears throat> the entire East Side is in a state of uproar. Mobs of vast size are organizing under the lead of anarchists and socialists and threaten to plunder and despoil the houses of the rich who have wronged and opposed them for so many years. It goes on to say, the Fifth Avenue Hotel will be the mm-hmm. first to feel the fury of the mob. Let's stop right there. You know who else owns a hotel? You know, no, no, no I'm serious. <laughs> you know who else owns a hotel? Who? Trump. Trump Hotels and Trump Tower. Really? Never heard of it. Guess what street that's on, dude? <laughs> Fifth Avenue? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Well, now... <laughs> You're laughing, but dude, it gets crazy. No, no, no. no, I know, I know. Yeah. No, 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 to you, because it <laughs> describes the address of the of the hotel. Well, okay. <laughs> and the hat, the address as the twenty second down uh, the twenty second down Broadway, the seventh down Madison Avenue. Now, the twenty second down Broadway, I'm not kidding, is Trump Towers, and the seventh down Madison Avenue not kidding, is the Trump Hotel. Yeah, yeah. yeah, And then you come over here to uh, Trump Tower. Let's see. This is Madison Avenue. And guess what, dude? This is Fifth Avenue. And what was the tower called in the the book? Fifth Avenue Hotel. Okay. Well, and look, (laughs) why does it say time machine right over there? Right next to Trump Tower. Where? To the right. To the right. <laughs> I don't see what? it. Where? <laughs> Literally down, right there. You're on it. To the Dude. right. <laughs> Wait, what? 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 Wait, okay, what? No, I'm sold. Dude, well, I what? Gotta... Wait, Why what? Why did you say that? Um, what have we discovered? Whoa. I gotta oh take a goodness. screenshot of that. Wait, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> so those guys were having a good time with it, but I thought it was interesting. They didn't have a whole lot of, of views on this, but they found something that I didn't see anybody else find. And it and it's so crazy because when you read it and you describe it, all of those things are uh, super interesting. 
uh, to say the very least. But it does get a little bit crazier if you're ready, Dave. Unless you got something. Else I'm to ready. Say. Gosh, this is <laughs> this is just mind blowing. It so is amazing. This one right here will make the hairs on your back of your neck stand up. Maybe I'm not gonna I'm not gonna give you a guarantee, but it's possible that the hairs on the back of your neck will stand up. So here we go. Before the 19th century books were discovered, a rumor was spreading on the internet. On August 17, 2016, a 4chan user made a claim that Donald Trump was in possession of a time machine. In this thread, the user posted the background information about Nikola Tesla and his connection to Donald Trump. 1943, after Tesla's death, the FBI declared all of his research to be top secret and ordered all his possessions to be seized. The FBI later appointed an MIT professor to make sense of his notes to see if any information in them could be used to create military weapons. The MIT professor was none other than John Trump, Donald Trump's uncle. Uh, today we have with us an engineer who typifies that American capability of converting great ideas into operating mechanisms that can then be turned over, as it were, to the man in the street for safe and proper uh, use and applications. Only Professor John Trump, who is with us today, did not stop there. Now, when you uh, went to MIT, I believe your original intentions, if they may be so described, was to go into uh, electric power types of applications, is that right? That's right. I had become interested in the design of electric power machinery. And he has some wild ideas, but I've, a, I've checked a few of them and they stood up. For six weeks I decided they, they were plausible and reasonable and I abandoned uh, the design of electric machinery and uh, began studying uh, the insulation of high voltages in vacuum and the acceleration of heavy particles to high energies. My uncle explained that to me many, many years ago, the power, and that was 35 years ago. He would explain the power of what's going to happen, and he was right. We now know that Tesla was interested and experimented in wild ideas such as wireless electricity, Wi-Fi, free energy, anti-gravity, invisibility, and even time travel. After Tesla's death, John Trump went over Tesla's notes and utilized his discoveries to develop the first million volt x-ray generators for rotational radiation therapy. Although John Trump thought Tesla's time machine was possible, it could not be created using the technology from that era. John Trump later died in 1985, but not before leaving Tesla's notes to his beloved nephew, Donald Trump. Around the same time, Trump was using pseudonyms such as John Miller and John Barron in partial homage to his uncle. Old spokesman, as the Washington Post headline writes, Maybe that it's been such an open secret for so long, it's hard to believe that anyone okay. is still questioning okay. it. What's your name again? John Miller. And you work with Donald Trump? Yes, that's correct. How often is it? It was back in the 1980s, and when the flashy New York real estate mogul needed to get a bit of news out, the newspaper reports it was common knowledge among New York reporters that Trump just assumed a different name and handled the media calls himself. I can conclude. Uh, with a fair degree of scientific certainty that it is Donald Trump's voice. This afternoon, Owens compared the John Miller on that phone call with People magazine to the real Donald Trump interviewed on CNN's Larry King Live in the 1990s. Due to the quality of the old recordings, he couldn't use his biometric analysis that he says would be absolutely certain, but based on pitch, tone, cadence, and his expertise, John Miller and Donald Trump are one and the same. Yes, it's my opinion that it is Donald Trump's voice. Now it's suggesting that you, you misled us. Yeah, that I'm lying. I'm not lying. His denial was, you know, it was, that doesn't sound like me. It's, a, it's interesting, because if somebody called me up and said, did you call and pretend to be your own PR person, I would say, no, I never did. I, would, I have never done something like that, ever. I wouldn't say right. that doesn't sound like me. Right. So you, you, you don't believe him. Were you surprised to see him misleading? 
No, I'm not surprised to see him misleading. Of course not. I mean, I would probably be a little shocked that you know this came into my life. Or, but the, Megan, the main thing here is that I didn't leak the tape, and there what? were two people on the conversation. Wait, you t you taped it because you're a reporter doing yeah, your job. Yeah, and I lost the tape. Were you were the only one with a copy of the tape? Yes. When did you lose it? Back 25 years ago. Did somebody have stolen it? No. It was in my house, and then I moved apartments. So who else would have had a copy of the tape? Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. So you're suggesting, you're suggesting Trump leak this to the yes. Washington Post? Yes. Why? He got me. He's done stranger <laughs> things. Because he loves publicity? Yeah. So you're suggesting that he may want us talking about this right now because it generates a news cycle, perhaps? Hello, Donald. <laughs> These names would be exposed during his 2016 presidential campaign run. However, there was another pseudonym Trump used that isn't well known. John Titter. Titter in particular is of special interest to this conspiracy. Oliver, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, Oliver, just give us an overview of uh, who John Titter was. Sure. Um, John Teeter. Actually, um, I just took a look at the calendar, and it was it's going to be exactly 10 years ago, November 2nd, that somebody claiming to be a time traveler from the year 2036 um, went on a series of Internet forums uh, claiming to be a time traveler, and they offered to answer questions. They talked about the future, about technology, um, you know, how time travel worked. And for a period of three months, this person answered questions, and then they announced that they were going to leave. And this is March of 2000, uh, March of 2001. This person announced that they were leaving, and they were never heard from again. And I think the reason why we're here talking about it 10 years later is because a lot of what this person said, people feel has come to pass. I'm um, talking about the physics and the technology and the politics. You know, we're here and I'm here because some of the things that this person said sure made it sound like they really were who they said they were, a time traveler. Making claims as early as November of 2000 to be a time traveler from the year 2036, Tiller spoke of events that happened in his native timeline onto an obscure internet discussion board posting several warnings for personal reasons. Answering questions directed toward him, he even posted several pictures showing the instruction manual and the time device manufactured by General Electric in the back of his 1967 Chevrolet. There are rumors he even faxed messages to various radio hosts like Art Bell of Coast to Coast AM, warning of the impending future. He spoke of terrible events that would occur from early 2000 through 2012 leading to war. He did not name Islamic terrorism, but mentioned that a skyscraper would vanish in New York. Not speaking specifically, because the timeline was often in flux. But one of the predictions that this person made in the facts, he said that in New York, there's a skyscraper missing. He says, where, where I'm from in my time, there's a skyscraper that's missing. This is 1998, so 9-11 had not happened here. So a lot of people point to that as John trying to, you know, signal that, hey, I'm, I am who I say I am, and you're not going to realize it until the year 2001. BuzzFeed dug up an old quote from Donald Trump, talking about a large-scale terror attack 19 months before 9-11. In his 2000 book, The America We Deserve, Trump wrote, I really am convinced we're in danger of the sort of terrorist attacks that will make the bombing of the 1993 Trade Center look like little kids playing with firecrackers. Trump also mentioned the mastermind of the attack, writing, quote, One day, we're told that a shadowy figure with no fixed address named Osama bin Laden is public enemy number one, and U.S. jet fighters lay waste to his camp in Afghanistan. He escapes back under some rock, and a few news cycles later, it's on to a new enemy and a new crisis. Trump. Wait, 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 yeah. wait, wait. Mm -hmm. Okay, hold yeah. on a second. Mm -hmm. Is this really Trump before 9-11? Have you read this? It's 2000 in his book. Are we making that? Did you Nick. make this up, Mika? <laughs> Nick.
I don't know if that guy was a time traveler or not, but everything he said about that machine is true. And maybe only 20 people knew about it because it was a marketing issue at the time that they didn't want people to know that the, the machine was that versatile because then it would have diminished their business. So they kept that under wraps. So at the time, there was only about 20 people that knew that this machine could do it. And, you know, apparently John Teeter was one of them or he really was a time traveler. So that, that right there, like when I saw that, I was like, what do you say to that? You know, what do you think? What do you think, David? I mean, I want to hear your thoughts on it. When I heard it, I was like mind blown um, to the max almost. Well, this is, this is amazing. And as so many midnight rides, this is going to be one I'm going to have to go back and listen to yeah. over and over the, the things here uh, are beyond any kind of realm of coincidence. And right now, the way I look at it, uh, I don't believe in time travel, but what I do believe in is predictive programming. And I think the devils have to do it in Matthew 10, 26, fear them not therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. And I believe they have to tell ahead of time. They're under a spiritual law. I don't think they probably know that, but they do that. They're compelled to do it in books. And here we see predictive programming in a book before we've seen it in so many movies. But these coincidences are just beyond uh, the realm of any kind of a coincidence. So if it's not time travel, which I can't accept, I would have to believe that there are very very powerful dark entities that are wanting to create and fulfill a scenario. I agree. Just wait, though. There's more. Oh so my. we're gonna. We're gonna <laughs> there's oh more. My. There's more. I and tell after, you what. And after this, after this, like oh, couple man. things, I'm gonna let you guys ask some questions and stuff. But uh, I mean, we could go on. There's there's so many things in this. So I'm I'm just gonna go through this one real quick. Now this is um, Casey from Enter the Stars hit on this, and this is what triggered me to look into it a little bit but um on the amazon reading it says baron trump's marvelous underground journey is the gulliver travels for our time now if, if you remember gulliver's travels he's taken up in a cyclone as well into this portal that puts him in this cave and um there's interesting connections with this that this guy pointed out and i just want to watch this we're going to check this out because it is really really cool to say the least so here we go the artist that did the background scenes in the 1939 Gulliver Travels film, he also painted the patio at Mar-a-Lago, Thump's Florida mansion. And here are some images from that particular painting. Here it is right here. This was this is actually from the dining room, but this was probably likely, this mural was likely also painted by the same artist. His name is Louis Jambor. And as you can see, it is a scene of a shipwreck, which of course was the central theme in Gulliver's Travels. Now, Louis Jambor, this artist, this is actually uh, the dining room, one of the dining rooms from Mar-a-Lago. Louis Jambor, also painted murals for Edison's Hotel and the Tesla's Wyndham, New Yorker. So there are some connections here, aren't there? Portals, magnetism, electricity, funnels, spirals, nested realities, and worlds within worlds. The first thing I want to do is show you what I found in a particular movie called Gulliver's Travels. Because I wanted to see if there were any other theatrical remakes of Gulliver's Travels. Because the one that the original one was from 1939. Sure enough, I found the remake with Jack Black in it. This was from 2010. Many of you will remember this film, Gulliver's Travels with Jack Black. It did pretty well in the box office, but it didn't get very good reviews. And I found some stuff in there that 
is just pretty crazy because it's all about portals and funnels and spirals and everything else we've been talking about. So let's take a look at this. What you're going to see are clear depictions of Shiva, the destroyer. Shiva also opens portals. Okay. And that's why she is pictured at CERN. There's a giant Shiva statue because that's exactly what they're trying to do there is open up portals to hell. So it's kind of interesting that this would appear in Gulva's travel. Let's take a look at this. There it is right there. Shiva appears. Now, there's a whole plot line to this. and We're not here to really get into Gulliver's Travels, the movie with Jack Black in it. But I wanted to show you some of the symbolism from the film. Yes, just before he goes off on this journey to the Bermuda Triangle, which again is another portal, to write a story, to be a travel writer, to impress this girl, right? But he has really no idea what he's doing because he's just a mailroom clerk. Wow. I am so impressed, Gulliver. I had no idea you were such a good writer. So here is your column basalt tree stump symbolism. These twisted portals that once reached the heavens. But in this case, it is a water spout, a water funnel. And this is what draws Jack Black into this portal and how he ends up in the land of Lilliput. So what we have here is a, a comparison to Gulliver's Travels, which is interesting as well. It's got the got the cyclones, the different stuff, and the fact that there's a mural painted by this guy in a Tesla facility and Trump's Mar-a-Lago, and um, I can't remember where else it said, but that that Denver Airport. Denver Airport, and this is to me, this is just mind blowing to me. I I, I can't believe the extent that they're going to go to it. But there's a lot of symbolism in a lot of these towers that I would love to kind of look at at least one day. But wow. uh, this is kind of just just the idea that there's all of these different symbols. And I'm with you, David. Like, e there's there's really only, like, a few options. You know, either, either, either Trump or his son's a time traveler is one option. Another option is predictive programming, which is what I would tend to believe. I mean, you have these entities that have been around for thousands of years, they, you know, we know that we know that Trump was set up to do a certain thing. And and one thing I didn't bring up in this is the dove comparison. So this is something kind of interesting as well. So Tesla had a love for pigeons and doves, right? He had them, they come to his tower. He had this one pigeon that was his favorite. It was a white dove. And on this, well, this white dove uh, came to him when he died, Tesla said, and the dove's eyes shone brighter than any lamp that he had created. He said when it died and it, and it passed when it died. And that was reminiscent to me of uh, Donald the Dove, that which was a nickname that John Trump had given Donald. But there's also a magazine where you can see Donald Trump holding this white dove. And at that time, he was talking about how if he was president, he could negotiate peace with Israel and um, pa or not Pakistan, but um, Iran, Iran, all of the Middle East. So he he talks about that, and that was his kind of thing. And so he's always kind of there's predicting program of him coming to negotiate this peace deal. And of course, you remember the the coin in Israel and uh, kind of the battle cry of Donald Trump. So it's it's all really kind of mind blowing. Does anything come to your mind, David? Well, there's a big one here, and of course we know the biblical symbolism of the dove representing the Holy Spirit. We see in this picture Donald Trump holding the dove, and absolutely the Luciferians believe that this real force was the Holy Spirit, yep. the universal magnetism of yep. the snake swallowing its tail. Yeah, the and, dove is always like classified as a spirit yeah. throughout all mythologies. Yeah. I mean, and, and Hitler believed if he could control the vril, he could control the world. It's scary. It makes me want to say. Who is this guy, Donald Trump, really? Yeah, that's and you what know, it makes me want to say that's what it makes me want to say too. Like it really does because there's so much, and, and of course, he is running again this next time around. We know that 
uh, his son Baron, which I don't want to bring his child into. I don't know how old the child is, but he's like six foot eight now. Uh, really, really like oh six, my foot, six foot eight, uh, big tall boy. Apparently very smart, um, and kind of described as this Baron Trump, like anxious to get out wow. and do different things and all of that different stuff. So it's interesting to say the least. But one a couple of verses, David, that I wanted to bring up because I thought the when I heard when with all of this in light. It kind of brought up some verses in Daniel, and I wanted to just kind of read uh, read them and, and get your take on these things because, um, you know, this really boggled my mind. There's not a whole lot of different conspiracy studies that kind of boggle my mind, but it really made me think deeper into all this man Trump and everything that's going on. So this is one of the verses here, and it says, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to tame, change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. And the reason this struck my interest is because it has this time, times, and dividing of times in it. And in Daniel 8, 23, 25, it says, And in the latter times of their kingdom, when the transgressors, I'm going to pull this up so you guys can see it. When the tra transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his policy also he shall create craft to prosper in his hand, and shall, he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up, up against the prince of pence, princes, but he shall be broken without hand. And I, I didn't know if to you any of those things have any kind of resemblance. Now, I, I, don't, I, I know I've heard different commentary, and we've talked about the time, the times and the dividing of time, but do you have any insight into what, if that could be talking about it or this understanding of dark sentences could be any reference to this? Well, certainly when it talks about this King understanding dark sentences to just think about the fact that Donald Trump has Tesla's papers is really is, is just mind blowing to me. And it, it talks about him being able to destroy wonderfully. Even if we would just consider the nuclear arsenal that the president has at his disposal, he could destroy wonderfully, let alone the more exotic weaponry that is there that the common populace doesn't know about. And causing craft to prosper, you know, he's the guy that made the economy boom. And I hate to say it, but I, I don't hate to say it. It's just a fact, like it or lump it. But uh, this was the thing that enamored the people with Adolf Hitler. Uh, the Weimar Republic was in a horrific depression. People were starving. And uh, Hitler uh, put Germany back to work and he turned the economy around. And the first time he ran, uh, he got 80% of the evangelical Christian vote. So there's so many things that check boxes here. Um, it, it is it is chilling, and it does make the hair stand up on your neck. It really does. It is, uh, um, you know, these things are not a coincidence. And like we've said, there's only a few options that uh, are available to us. And uh, it doesn't look good for um, Mr. Trump being someone sent from God. It looks like it could be quite the opposite. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's so much here to unpack, and and so and so much to be seen yet, right? You know, this this is one of those subjects that you know I had looked into when the the, the book first became popular. Looked into it a little bit, but I I usually like to kind of take a step back. Instead of you know reacting on each little thing that comes out, take a step back and look at the overall picture and kind of bring it all together. And I in doing that with this um, really brings to the light of a lot of different things. And I'm thankful to have been able to do it. I know that you know we're going to be taking questions from you guys in the chat, so make sure you put your questions in caps so they'll catch my eye better in the chat. Um, but before we get going, I want to do what we call the pounders pound and that's where you pound your like button like you've never pounded it before because this helps us in the algorithm it tells youtube that this is a video 
you guys want to see, right? And <laughs> and so do that for us, guys. I, I'm going to say, man, this went fast. It I mean, did go I can't fast. believe it's over yet. I know. And I tell you what, this is one I'd have to pound hard on. I think this is one of my favorite rides of all time. This is, <laughs> I mean, this has got me going, and I know it does our listeners too. So absolutely, pound away. Well, that's awesome to hear from you, David. Let's count it off. Here you go. One, two, three three boom boom thank you guys so much for doing that now we're going to take some questions from the chat uh questions or comments and uh we're going to go with go do that tonight and like i said we like we said we appreciate you guys listening i mean it is uh you could be doing anything but you're here with us and we really uh we don't take that lightly so i'm and hearing that from you david it's one of your favorite rides that's pretty cool because we've done a lot of rides and we've had a lot of crazy stuff this is definitely one of the wildest ones and definitely worthy of the conspiracy cowboy hat here you know the the tinfoil hat going on here <laughs> absolutely but, so um here's our first question here and i might miss some of them so if i miss it just post it again um cruel kilgore says what do you guys know of project looking glass and the ties to trump do you know anything about project looking glass and the ties to trump i don't I don't either, but I, I would definitely going to look into it since you mentioned it. Uh, one thing I didn't mention in the show, too, is that Tesla, before he died, was working on an experience, uh, experiment in 1943 where they were cloaking invisibility on a um, carrier in the ocean. And uh, a lot of people went missing after this experiment. A lot of people died from this experiment, um, but they were successful and, and able to do this, according to that, and also the Philadelphia experiment and all these things were in play at the time of Tesla's death. And from what I could gather from several sources is that Tesla actually died in a Trump hotel uh, owned by the Trumps, which is interesting as well. And so I don't know what to make of that as either, but that's pretty pretty crazy. So I, I will look into that, though, because that does um, Project Looking Glass. I'm going to have to write that down. Um Definitely not. Dick Richard says, thank you. God bless you. Love you both in Jesus name. We love you too. Thank you so much. Um, Yvonne asked, um, this is not necessarily related, but who is the army in the book of Joel? What do you think, David? I know you know this one. Yeah. And the army in the book of Joel, uh, is not the good guys. And you know, a lot of people, they want to claim to be Joel's army. But, uh, you know, these are the army that is released from the pit in Revelation 9. So, yeah. And, and that's you know, the short answer on that. There's so much more we could say there, but not the good guys. And I think that's what they're trying to do. Like the way this book uh, kind of read out, it was like these, these uh, entities down there were basically trying to convince Baron of how wonderful it is down there as opposed yeah. Yeah. to up there and because of certain issues, you know, and yeah. we know, we know um, like some of the issues were the sun and the cold and stuff. And we know that global warming and um, blotting out the sky and stuff like that is on the, on the agenda of, um, you know, the weather suppression, weather control yeah. of the elite. And I, I did a teaching entitled Donald Trump and Joel's army. And it's on our Brideon channel, on our FOGC Brideon. And I went into the people like Rick Joyner and uh, Todd Bentley and a lot of the people that call themselves Joel's Army. And the movement, the pro-Trump right-wing movement, they called themselves Joel's Army, which biblically is the the army from the abyss. Mm -hmm. So, man, that that's a, you know, that's a chilling thought. And... And, I, and I'll just say this, uh, and I know, my goodness, uh, I realize the zeal that, you know, the zeal for the Trumpites is as strong as the zeal for the left-wingers. But I, And I, as anyone listening to us knows, we've not been a fan of Donald Trump. And, uh, I've, and I'd say right now, after this show, I have more leaning to think that it's really, really the bad side of things with Mr. Trump. I mean, it is just chilling to me. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. I mean, it is chilling. The implications of what all this could mean could be could be very chilling. And um, sorry, here I got to skip down here a little bit. Okay, so the next question is from Do by Brian and Debbie McCartney, and I can already tell you I haven't, but I'm going to read this question anyway in case some of you guys want to research this, and I know I will later as well. 
um, they say, did you research Trump's aunts and the Hebrides revival? Did you, have you ever researched that? I have not. That's not something I've ever heard of, but I will definitely check it out. Uh, Brian says, Brian Hawthorne says, do you think he chose the name Baron Trump for a reason in the story? And I, and I think that if he's aware of this book, I think he did. Like, I think that's definitely something that he would do. The, let's put it this way. If this guy is trying to base his life off the book, he spent a lot of money to do it, to get his hotel on those same exact spots, to get, to get a tower in the same exact spots, naming his son after this character. Um, I mean, it's possible, but that's a lot of, a lot of money. And I like the chances of somebody being able to achieve that are, are, are astronomical. I mean, uh, based on a book and also having to be a billionaire as well. Yeah. And I, I think maybe it could very well be true that Mr. Trump is aware of these books and is trying to pattern things in his life after them. And I think it's also very true that there could be very powerful dark forces aiding him. Just the possibility of aligning those pieces of real estate, like in the book, I mean, that's just off the chart, um, improbable to ever happen. It, it's just absolutely amazing that that happened. Yes. Um, Michael Mulvey says, this is off topic, but... Uh, David and John, along with anybody else, does anyone know about Ron Wyatt and his discovery of the Ark of the Covenant and the test analysis of the blood? I only know what I've what I've heard from uh, different people on it. Of course, we haven't been able to see the tests or anything personally, but from what I understand, the the test came back with one strand of DNA, not the male strand of DNA in his in the blood. Whether or not I believe the story, I don't know. You know, it's interesting. There's definitely a a lot of interest around Ron Wyatt's work that I've seen that he did some pretty interesting stuff. You know, his, um, we have friends that are connected to his wife and I mean, he believed pretty much all of what he said. I believe that let's leave it. At, I guess, leave it at that. Um, Joel Sandritz asks, he says, is it possible that there's a connection between all of the satellites going up and them trying to open portals? What do you think, David? Well, I know satellites are not what they tell us satellites are. And um, it, it could very well be a connection with that. Uh, we're being lied about about so many things. Satellites is just another one of those. They're definitely up there, but I believe they're definitely not what they claim that they are. So since this is the big, big thing that I believe underlies the convergence of science falsely so-called in the occult, I think it's very, very likely that that's the case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so too. Um, definitely. I mean, I think that, that the only way some of these beings can reside in this area, there has to be some kind of grid, you know, like at least it, it's possible you could assume that from the stuff you read about this. I mean, why are they underground if they're so powerful? Why are they, you know, lasting underneath in the ground, just like with Hitler's army, they talked about these huge giant race of super beans. Why are they hiding themselves in the ground? If they can't, you know, there may be a reason they can't come up. And there's, there's also Indian legends over in the Grand Canyon area where these men uh, that had shining eyes took them under the ground during the flood into the Grand Canyon area. And there's actually a place there that only the Indians can go. That is where this portal supposedly was that took them down into the earth. So there's lots of stories that are revolving around this stuff. Uh, but I think the possibility that they need a grid in order to interact, I'm going to take this hat off. This thing, this thing uh, is cool and all, but it gets, I don't know. It felt like it was getting a little heavy for me. So I don't know. I put too much aluminum foil, foil in there, but yeah, I think that that's, there's a real possibility of that too, man. It's crazy. I don't know. I don't even know where to, you know, I don't know everything about science or anything like that, but I believe if something is electric and there's a reason that they're going to put up a grid and I think that there's evidence, and David, you showed a lot of this in one of the shows that we did on Enoch, I think, or on the Midnight Ride, where the, it looked like the placement of a lot of these pyramids and stuff on ley lines had to do with an electrical grid mm -hmm. at the time. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I believe we had an antediluvian civilization that uh, had communication all over the earth, travel all over the earth, and a power grid over all of the earth. Yeah. Yep, I think I agree with that. I mean, that's that's what it looks like for sure. Um, so, 
Andy Anden333 says, I think Elon understands Tesla's work. What do you think? I think they either understands it or may have gotten some of the patents from Trump. Um, the fact that he named his company Tesla is an interesting thing. And we were talking a little bit too about the, the Tau, which is the T, the Hebrew T, or in the, in the Greek T, the Tau, and what that means in reference to all of this. And, and it's interesting because the Trump's first name starts with T, Tesla's first name starts with T. The Tesla logo for the company is a giant Tau symbol with a pentagram in the middle. Oh. Um, and you, you had a book, David, I think you still got it over there, about the Tau. And it was interesting what it, what it talks about because in the Bible it does talk about the Tau being a mark that separates the good from the evil. Um, but also other things, and I'll let you read that. I think it was in that Ezekiel book you have over there. The uh... Yes, and I'll give the biblical text here in Ezekiel 9 and verse 4. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. We should be more concerned about the mark of God than the mark of the beast, by the way. But this is uh, Daniel Block's commentary on Ezekiel, Ezekiel and his commentary on that text. He says, those who exhibit this response, that of sighing and crying over the abominations, are to be marked with a taw on the forehead. Taw is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, in the archaic cursive script, it had the shape of an X or a cross, a form that remained essentially unchanged from the early stages of the evolution of the alphabet until the, adop the adoption of the square Aramaic script. It is preserved to this day in Western scripts as T. This tall placed on the foreheads of the most visible sign of the body was to serve as a distinguishing mark to separate the righteous from the wicked. Like the blood on the doorposts of the Israelites, houses on the night of the Passover, Exodus 12, and the scarlet cord in Rahab's window, Joshua chapter 2 and chapter 6. It was a sign of hope. However, since in ancient custom the taw also served as a mark of ownership, the possibility that this mark represented Yahweh's signature, his claim on those who were citizens of the true kingdom of God, deserves consideration. So this, to me, when I hear you say that, and when I hear that commentary, it's, it states as a Tao being a mark from God, but it also states a Tao being a mark of ownership for slavery, uh, which I believe that there's obviously two marks mentioned in the Bible. There's the mark of the beast, and then there's the mark of God, which are, people are marked with God. So it's really interesting that that symbol is the chosen. And of course, you know, he's going to say, well, it stands for Tesla and it probably does. Uh, but the, the way it's actually formed to me, I thought was pretty interesting in a pentagram. Yeah. And, you know, I think the text we read in Daniel about the, the King that understands the dark sentences opposing the King of Kings. And, and it's all about the counterfeit uh, and the claim of the dark kingdom to be the true kingdom of God. It is just chilling. It is just very, very chilling and disturbing uh, when you start to connect these dots because they're not coincidences. Yeah, and it's what's, you know, the disturbing thing about it too is that, you know, from all outside appearances for people who are hating evil, which, you know, we all hate evil, and of course that automatically hates, that we hate the, the left-handed path, you know, the left has always been associated with evil and almost every, in the Bible, you know, the left hand of, uh, what is it called? The left hand of iniquity or something like, uh, something along those lines is quoted several times as being uh, evil. And you have the left-handed path and we know that the left-handed path is doing horrible things. Uh, before QAnon ever posted anything about all this stuff, this is stuff that has been talked about for 30 plus years by you. You know, this is stuff that has yeah. maybe not been brought to full everybody's attention, everybody's full attention, like this, uh, these people were able to bring it out. But this is stuff that would lead all of us to believe that this is going on. And it's going on by these left handed path people. And so when Trump, when people like him are coming out saying that they're going to do something about it, they're going to expose it, they're going to do all that. 
it's easy to be like, I'm siding with this guy because no matter how arrogant the guy may be or whatever, you know, and he's even fun to listen to a lot of, there's a lot of things about Trump that I really enjoy. I feel like I could sit around the table with Trump and have a good time hanging out. You know, this, that's the kind of, I used to a little less after this show, <laughs> after this show. Yeah. Well, you know, a little less, maybe my, now. my intentions might be a little different after this show. It'd probably be to like pick his mind be like, okay, man, you got to tell me. Are you a time traveler? Is your son what What is going on here? You know, I would I would definitely uh, ask him that question if I if I had the opportunity. But uh, yeah. but by all in, by all appearances, he seems to be the good guy, right? And, and yeah. the guy with the white hat. Yeah, he's the guy the the good guys like. Now, I the clip you played from Morning Joe, Joe and Mika, the amazing statement Trump made about even mentioning Osama bin Laden's name in yeah. New York. Now, how could that happen? Now, here again, and this is just me, this is my theory, but if Mr. Trump is in communication with the dark powers, they could have very easily told him what they were going to do. Mm. This could be the source of information there. That's just a possibility yeah. to explain this. We need to, there's got to be some explanation for this. Yep. And all of the explanations that um, I'm coming up with is not looking good for Mr. Trump being on the right side of things. I mean, I, I'm, the, I'm the same way. There's got to be an explanation. That sounds like the most logical one to me, um, assuming there's no such thing as demonic time travel of some sort, which I don't believe in. I can't, I, I can't hardly believe in, I can't hardly bring myself to believe the idea that time travel is a possibility. Yeah, but I, then again, I don't know, like biblically, I may find later on that Bible says, you know, this people were traveling and seeing different yeah, things in time. Yeah. So. And I, I have told, I know you did the show on the Mandela effect. I totally reject that. And I think time travel, I think the devil might like us to think he can but I think that's above his pay grade. I don't yeah. think he's that powerful. If he could do that, yeah. uh, he could go back and try to stop the crucifixion. That's yeah. just impossible. I don't believe he has that power. But I, at this point, I'm. this is the first time I've had a lot in uh, common with Joe Scarborough when he says, you know, Mika, did you make that up? Did you just make him that up? But no, <laughs> he really said that. And how could he say that? Um, yeah. I yeah. think he's got a little help there. I yeah. think this is a little inside information, maybe. And I wonder, too, you know how in in the different prophetic verses you had the angel in the whirlwind taking the prophets to see things that were to come. Yeah, This could be a, a version of that. They're taking yeah. them to see what is to yeah. come or see what has already happened, and they think they're time yeah. traveling, maybe. And the thing with dark prophecy, dark prophecy is not definitive, yeah. but dark prophecy is prophesying of the plans and goals that the fallen powers have. Yeah. And that's why it can change, right? That's why they have yeah. these idea of the alternate timelines type yeah. thing, because it's not only God is able to separate the end from the beginning and separate the ages, right? He's the only one able to do that. But I think you're right. I think it's possible that there's a dark prophecy thing. They're showing them what's going to happen if they have their way. And then, you know, if it doesn't, it's, oh, there's an alternate timeline. And it may be even just close, but not quite on point, you know. Yeah. So, interesting. Yeah. Um, so, next question is from Javier Fernandez. How do you think the Great Reset is going? Everyone seems to be a Jesuit. What do you think, David, about the Great Reset? How do you think it's going? Well, they are, and you know, here again, we look at things, and it looks like the Democratic a.k.a. socialist communist <laughs> reset is having a few problems. Mm -hmm. And it looks like, yeah, the good guys are going to win. We're going to clean house the next election. We'll take the house. We'll take yeah. the Senate. Trump will be back. Isn't that great? Well, is it? Yeah. So how is the great reset going? Uh, I think that this is all a part that is being constructed. It, it just looks like this is all a part of the dark plan. Yeah, it really does. I mean, I don't know how else to say it, uh, how else you can get around that. So next, the next quote is, or next, um, I guess, comment is this, and this is something we touched on a little bit, but the man who wrote the Trump books also wrote an occult book. Yeah, he did. And, and there's no doubt by reading what I read from him that this man was one of the most adept 
in the occult that I've ever seen out of any like fictional writer, even the people that did Lord of the Rings or uh, a lot of these movies that are directly related to this stuff. This guy, in almost everything he writes, there's a code. And I, and I went through several pages painstakingly seeing them over and over and over and over again. And that's not something you can do with every book because some books don't lead to everything. Everything doesn't lead to something. But this book is unlike a lot of the books that I've read in in reference to any kind of um, occult story, I guess you could say, because it also involved futuristic things, which, you know, a lot of those don't. So. Yeah. And it's almost could be a proof text on how the dark side could identify their man. Yeah. Yeah, it, it definitely could. And I think a lot of the stuff too on there, which was, I thought was interesting as well, is you could uh, you could see how uh, what the Wizard of Oz, because they have this marble road that they're going down, uh, was probably taken from this story too because it was written after this book. And there's a lot of reference to some of that stuff in there oh, too. Yeah. You have the dog, yeah. like Toto, you know, you have yeah. this marble road that they're taking down. Um, yeah tornado and yeah tornado it's all there yeah. it's all there yeah it's so all there. It, definitely stolen from it in, in I, I believe stolen from it in a lot of ways um so michael carico one of your fellow caricos i don't know if you know michael but i is michael one of the north carolina caricos i think with, so yeah with I, one r i think so i okay well no, i know him then we've talked with him before I, so. well this guy got two r's so two r's, R's well, i don't guy. know if I've, t I've talked with some north carolina caricos with one r but uh, I don't know. Anyway, we're glad to hear from you. Yeah, they can't be all that bad, you know. Well, no, yeah. absolutely not. <laughs> well, Michael says, um, could Trump be the right-wing leader that eats the left as spoken of in the Bible? And you've talked uh, a lot about that. We did a whole yeah. show about the three-headed eagle. Yeah, that's another whole level of this that uh, just reinforces this idea that uh, indeed, and that is from the book of Second Estrus, and I think that this is this was just bringing this scenario around. You know, here it looked like uh, Trump was gone. And also you have the symbolism of the healing of the head wound. Mm -hmm. Looks like Trump was dead. Well, no, he's not. Here he comes back. The head wound's healed. He's back. And just like in the book of Estrus, the right wing eats the left. And, of course, this would, uh, for the right wing to eat the left, the left would have to be thoroughly... Uh, publicly humiliated, and it is. There's never been a time when the hatred and vitriol mm. has been generated against an administration like this one, and it just keeps escalating. It is the most laughable farce of a government that's ever been established, and uh, it's getting ready to get eight, I think. I think it's about to get its lunch eight. Yeah, I think so too, man. And it's that that's was another interesting midnight right to go oh, back on. Yeah. So um Joseph Field says, Does your tinfoil cowboy ha help with stopping the reptilian shapeshifters lasers from getting your social security number? Uh I don't know. You know, maybe I don't know um why they'd want my social security number, but I don't know what it does. I just know I know this. I do this is this is a, another weird thing, okay. So I have this uh, reader that reads EMFs, it reads radio signals and magnetic, you know, electric, magnetic, and all these different, all three, it's like a three-way reader. And I can tell you this, you put the 11 and 4 in front of that reader and you got something on the other end that may be spiking up uncontrollably, it stops dead. So aluminum foil does have properties to stop uh, waves. And so that's interesting. Uh, but I don't know if they're trying to steal my social security number. Uh, or not. I don't know. I don't know how it all works. I know lead is an interesting thing as well that we talked about earlier that kind of stops magnetic radiation from entering through. So who knows? You know, maybe it does. Uh, Marvin from Aloha. He says Aloha from Maui, John and Dave. And so what's up, Marvin? Thank you for your shout hey, from Maui. Marvin. Would love to be in Hawaii one of these days. I know that it's a beautiful place. Maybe the Lord will call us to do mission work oh, to man. Hawaii. Wouldn't that be cool? That'd be all right. Well, our luck will get uh, Haiti or something. So no, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all it's all good. Either one would be fine. But Chris Morin says, could the mark be the same as the mark of Cain, as it was set to keep people from killing him? What do you think, David? Well, just like this text that we read tonight in Ezekiel and the commentary, it shows protection and it shows ownership. And in Genesis four, verse thirteen, I believe. 
uh, or close to that, the mark of Cain, was to protect him from being killed. And the same way here, the mark and the seal we see in Revelation 7, the sealing of the Israel of God before the tribulation time. This is what we want to uh, really, really be concerned with. And I don't imagine that the angel put a physical T on the mark of the foreheads of these people that anyone could see, but there was a spiritual mark there. And it talked about the people that sigh and groan for the abominations. And it makes me think again of Mr. last midnight ride. We had Mr. Trump there waving the rainbow flag. Does that make you say, go, go, you're God's man, or does that mm -hmm. make you sigh and groan for the abominations that, uh, what could be more fitting than opposing the Most High God, as the prophetic scripture said there in Daniel? Amen to that. Uh, the next question, and we're only going to do two more here. Josh Daniel says, what about Kim Clement's prophecies about Trump? David, what do you think about this prophecies about King Clement and Trump and um what, what do you think about those? I have read them, but it's been so long ago, I can't really remember. So I'm going to have to pass. And from what I remember about the prophecies, I can't remember a lot about it, but I do remember the, the kind of scope of it is he's going to lead, uh, I guess, a revival and all of these, or some kind of revival. I think if this is the, the same prophecy um, that I'm thinking of, and I could be completely wrong, I could be thinking about somebody else. Uh, but I do think there will be a revival, but I think the revival will be people coming back to the Catholic Church, uh, possibly the one world religion, whatever that may be, and people will see it as Christianity, um, which is where you get the verse where Jesus warns us that they will think that they're doing the service to God by killing you. You know, people like that are these um, evangelicals, uh, Catholic, Catholicism, there's been years of... Um, persecution on the Christian church, especially from the Catholic church. I mean, they killed more Christians than almost any other people group in the world. They killed Christians uh, incessantly, just killed them. And uh, until they finally couldn't stop the production of the Bible anymore, and then they stopped. And And I think that also in people that do the Sabbath are going to be persecuted. Uh, Daniel talks about the abomination that causes desolation. And if you read in the book of Maccabees, which is a non-canonical book, but still got some very interesting history, some of the only history you can find during that temple period, it talks about the abomination desolations. And one of the links to the abominations of desolations was the ability to not keep the Sabbath, right? That was one of the things that was there. So there will be a tie to that, I believe. And do you think Trump's going to keep the Sabbath? Uh, probably not. And, um, also the eating of pork, you know, all, all of these different things that not that just the eating, but the sprinkling of the blood of pork on the altar. And we know, we know there's a lot going on with that. I mean, you could go on for hours think talking about the genetic manipulations and the idea of, of mixing pig and human humanity together. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot there. So what, what about you, David? I mean, what do you think when it comes to the idea of a false revival? What is the, what is it comes to your mind? I think there's going to be a true revival among the Israel of God that has separated itself from the harlot church. There will be a phony revival that will go on in the 501c3 churches, and Satan will want people to think that that's a real revival and have people get involved with it. And as I think, I, I, as I remember, there was something very off about Kim Clement's prophecy, and also, we talked about there was a prophecy from a Messianic rabbi down in Oklahoma or somewhere, and I know we pro played this clip uh, back during a right uh, around election time, and it said that Trump's meetings were going to turn into evangelistic services. Mm -hmm. And it's like these prophecies are off, but it's like this might come true, but the timeline's wrong. You know, and it looks like these are all pointing to the same program that a spiritual force is trying to bring about. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, it's chilling to me. It, it is just chilling to me. And um, I really hope that people um, that are wrapped up in this political solution are going to realize that there's not one that there's a huge, huge deception going on here. Mm, so true. Now, this is a question from Tim Morgan. He says, didn't Jesus say 
not to trust in men? And of course, the answer is, of course he did. Uh, we actually, me and John did a whole show last week about uh, an hour long show about that. And we've talked about it many times. You're never supposed to put your trust in men ever um, at all. So there you go. Anything else to add to that, David? Big amen. Big amen. So I just want to say thank you guys for listening. Make sure you guys subscribe if you like this content. Hit the like button. Go over to FOJC Radio. Check out their stuff over there. Go to nystv.org and check out content over there. Uh, Check out our other channels and our friends' channels and all that different stuff. You see some of them in the chat tonight. Cutting Edge, Truth Radio Show. Um, David just did a Rumble episode with Dan on Truth Radio Show make sure to check that out as Dan is banned from YouTube for right now. And, um, you know, just thank you guys. I mean, we, we couldn't do this without you. We're thankful to do this and we hope that we see you guys again next week. Y'all willing, we will see you guys the next week. David, roll us out, man. Well, I tell you what, John, you blew my mind tonight. Excellent <laughs> job. I mean, this is a 10 on the Richter scale for me. Cool. This is something that <laughs> I love it, man. And I know you all did too. And, uh, man, what can you say? But thank you, Jesus. And uh, I think, you know, the Lord will do nothing except he reveals his secret unto his servants, the prophets. And I think that uh, there's something big for us here to really pray and meditate about. And with that, a big thank you to our Midnight Ride audience for loving the truth and being willing to seek it out, for going down this journey with us of Uh, seeking the face of God, uh, understanding his mysteries, and preparing ourselves to be a light for him in these last days. God bless you all. So with that, high five and good night, everybody. We will see you next Saturday night, 10 p.m. Central, on the Midnight Ride. High five and good night, everybody. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast. Rise up, rise up, rise up, rise up.